Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Pepperell Christian Fellowship Worship Service for April 5, 2020. It's Palm Sunday, and I figured maybe everyone is getting a little tired of seeing only me in the picture, so I thought I'd bring some other folks in to wish you a Palm Sunday. Doug York, welcome. You're the first one on. Just beat Kaylee. Oh, no, maybe Kay Kaylee beats you. I don't know. That was a close call. Anyway, here's my family. You guys want to say hi? Hi. And this is the newest member of the family Annie's holding, Calvin. Uh, it's, uh, it's a special Palm Sunday, so uh, the whole Whitmer family is here to wish you a happy Palm Sunday. Do you guys want to say happy Palm Sunday again? Happy Palm Sunday! Yeah, we, uh, we, these guys are every Sunday morning are worshiping along with us. They just go upstairs uh, while I'm down here. Uh, this is my study down here, as you know, if you've been watching the last few weeks. Um, and the rest of the family is usually upstairs. Oh, but anyway, uh, thanks, Anne. Calvin and the beautiful kids and my beautiful wife. So uh, glad to see everybody hopping on. Aunt Marlene is joining us from Virginia. Great to have you here, Aunt Marlene. And the Vizacos and the Coxes and the Vasipolis and the Manleys and the Del Signores and Amanda. Hey, yeah, everyone, uh, If you as you come on, feel free to, um, to shout out. Um, I'm glad to see everyone's, uh, yeah, you're, you're giving your greetings to the congregation. Norma, we might need your grooming skills. Stephen's <laughs> refusing to cut his nails. <laughs> oh, Norma's just up the street so we can walk down and, and have her give us some instructions. Selix are here. here. Oh, wonderful, yeah. The poor ears are on. There's Christina. The closes are here. Sorry if I'm missing you. The Beals are here. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Tina. Hi to the puppy. And Anna Sarkeesian is here. Good morning to you, Anna. Anna. The Wolanskis are here. Great to have you guys here. And the Richters are on board. I'm getting a lick as we speak. Um, usually on Palm Sunday, we have these uh, these palms that, that we're all braiding and playing with during the service. I was thinking, you know, it's going to be hard to preach the sermon this morning without the sound of palms being braided in the background. But uh, maybe you all can... Uh, can can get some some self-service palms at home yeah Tyler Yates says I'm beautiful too so wonderful thanks Tyler for that <laughs> it's really fun to see everybody uh, wishing one another happy Palm Sunday and uh, and greeting each other so like just feel free to keep those comments coming this is one of the one of the ways we can interact with each other over the course of this weird time of separation where we're not with each other we can at least give a shout out from wherever we are, wherever we're joining, and uh, the rest of the church family. So, um, happy Palm Sunday to you all. I see a bunch of people are here and more are coming. So, uh, we're, we're glad that you guys are joining us this morning. Um, our family is going to be worshiping King Jesus uh, from our house on Heald Street, and we know that even though we can't see you, um, you are worshiping with us. So, Hey guys, maybe one last uh, greeting to everybody before you go upstairs. Hi guys. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks guys. Um, great to see the Gullivers joining and the Lunsfords and Rachel and the Wrights and the Salonas and the Gardeners and the Flemings. Uh, a lot of folks. Melody Nelson. Um, great. Just great to have you guys on. Uh, we're, we're honored that you are worshiping with us. If you're a member of our church family, uh, we're thankful that you're here. If you are a guest and don't regularly worship with us on Main Street in Pepperell, we are really honored that you're, you've come by to, to worship Christ with us. It is Palm Sunday, 2020. Liam Bradley has chosen four songs for us to listen to and sing this morning. And those four songs are Immortal, Invisible, In Christ Alone, Rock of Ages, and he will hold me fast. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't done this already, to listen to and maybe sing along with those songs after the sermon. Uh, it actually might be good to just develop a pattern as a family of having some family worship. So maybe start at 9.30 before I come on um, and take some time, listen to those songs, sing with those songs, have a, a, a little time of prayer as a family. We did some of that yesterday. It was really, really refreshing and helpful for us. Um, and I especially am thankful for these four songs that Liam has chosen for us. They point us to God's greatness. They point us to the hope of salvation in Jesus. 
and they point us to God's everlasting protection and preservation of us as people. I want to start this morning by allowing you to hear the words of that hymn, Rock of Ages, and be freshly reminded of the power and the beauty of the gospel, which is for us. So I'm going to read those four verses of Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure save me from its guilt and power not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands could my zeal no respite know could my tears forever flow all could never sin erase thou must save and save by grace nothing in my hands i bring Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. It's good to see uh, folks joining us, and I just want to continue to invite you to say hi to everybody as you come on. Uh, I do, I want to again just greet you if you're part of our PCF church family, and also if you're a visitor, and maybe while we're waiting a minute or two more for folks to join, can anyone type the fighter verse for this past week? I'll give you a hint. It's Galatians 6, 14, and um, can anyone type the fighter verse, Galatians 6, 14, um, anyone, let's see if, if anyone can say it, I'm just going to turn the mic microphone down a little bit here, so you don't get too much uh, splitting of the noise, anyone for the fighter verse? Hey, great to have the Lavishers here and the Ravelettes. Anyone for the fighter verse? I don't see you, um, anyone jumping on it yet. <laughs> Emma Whitmer says no. I, I suspect that may, might be a kid who's saying no, we can't do it. Galatians 6.14. Good morning, Phil. Can anyone bless the rest of us by sharing the fighter verse? It is a good one this week. It's good every week, but... It's, uh, it's especially helpful to, to focus and center on the gospel in times that are troubled and uncertain and difficult for all of us. Good morning, Stoats. Um, anyone for the fighter verse? I'm not going to bail you out here. Galatians 6.14. So uh, if you don't do it now, um, I, will, I will give you permission during the, the course of the rest of the service. If you don't look, but you've got to do it from memory. If it comes back to you, uh, feel free to jump back on and share it with the rest of us. This is Palm Sunday. Uh, it is our opportunity to remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, this week, as we prepare to, to remember his crucifixion and death and resurrection later in the week, uh, Jesus entered Jerusalem as a king to the acclaim of the crowds. And this morning, we are going to celebrate and worship him as king of our lives and king of the universe. It's such a great time to remind ourselves that Jesus is in control. Jesus sits on the throne. Jesus is the king. Nations rise and nations fall, but Jesus reigns over all. I read Psalm 2 this week in my devotional time, and it's a psalm of the Lord's anointed. It's a psalm of the, the Lord's chosen king. And the last three verses of that psalm say, Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So here's a reminder this morning on Palm Sunday that Jesus is the only king, the exalted king. He's been appointed as king by God himself, and it is the privilege of our lives to gladly submit to his rule 
and to take refuge in him. A few quick announcements here as we get going. We're going to share the Lord's Supper a little later in this service after the sermon. So this is a reminder to get some juice or water and some bread now if you haven't yet and you want to prepare for later in the service you can do that have those communion elements ready when the time comes we are planning to observe the Lord's Supper together each Sunday morning as a church family during this current season with the exception of next Sunday Easter Sunday because we're going to be focusing on the resurrection then rather than the crucifixion if you want to know more, a little bit more about why we're sharing the Lord's Supper during these online services and why we're doing it every week in, during this kind of extraordinary season, just click onto my pastor's blog on our church website and I have a bit more of an explanation there. And I want to acknowledge just off the bat here, um, this is our, our, I think, third week maybe of doing the Lord's Supper, uh, observing the Lord's Supper together. It, it might feel a little bit strange. It might feel less than fully satisfactory to you to be receiving the Lord's Supper when we're not all together in person. And if that's the way you feel, I affirm the feeling. Our normal practice is to be gathered as we share this meal and to receive common elements. So I, I hope you feel that ache to be together again. But we're not gonna let the, enemy, the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I believe there is grace for us in receiving this communion meal regularly during a season in which we're physically scattered. And so my prayer is that you will be reminded of the gospel afresh this morning and each morning we share this meal, both through the preaching of God's word and also through the Lord's Supper. A little later in this service, we're also gonna share a responsive reading that focuses on Jesus as our King. And we emailed that reading out to you on the PCF News list this past week. Um, the reading is also posted on this PCF Facebook page that you're watching now. So please make sure that you have that responsive reading ready when we get to that point in the service. And if you don't have it now, maybe open another browser page, click over there. You could print it out or just have it on your screen um, when we get to that point in the service. Just before this service, there was a Zoom call from 9.10 to 9.50 a.m., for anyone who wanted to pray together and that's going to be happening each Sunday morning so please feel free to join in on that we sent out a link to that zoom call in the PCF news this past week all you have to do is click on the link and then follow the instructions to be part of that prayer time And I encourage you that's another way to prepare your hearts for this gathered service um, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. after the service this morning David Fenton will be teaching his adult education course on 1 Corinthians for the second time. He started last week. And again, that's via a Zoom call at 11.15 a.m. We sent out a link to that Zoom call in the PCF News this past week. And if you need that and you didn't get it for some reason, you can text me or call me after the service, not during the service, and uh, I'll get that to you. Also remember that every Monday evening from 7 to 8 p.m., we're hosting an hour of prayer and encouragement, and that's open to everyone in the congregation via a Zoom call. And the great thing about a Zoom call is that you can see everybody else. So you're not just looking at one person, you're looking at and listening to other members of the congregation, which is so encouraging. To, uh, i just let you know that. Um, you know that if you've done any Zoom calls or video chats with other folks. Um, our first Monday evening prayer and encouragement was this past week. We had seven people meet together online, and it was sweet and powerful praying together. So I would love for you to join us tomorrow evening, 7 p.m. And again, the link to that Zoom call is on the PCF news list. So hopefully you already received that and went out on Friday. Um, that's a great way this coming Monday to prepare your heart, your soul, by praying together for us. Uh, with us for Holy Week. And speaking of Holy Week, we'll have an online Good Friday service this coming Friday at 7 p.m. and we'll be sharing the Lord's Supper at that service, so please do have bread and juice in your home ready for that time. And then next Sunday, April 12, is Easter Sunday and we'll be celebrating in our online service at 10 a.m. And I especially want to invite you I encourage you to invite your friends to that online service. You know, very, very often we have many guests at our services on Easter Sunday morning. And I don't see any reason why we can't invite folks over social media. So uh, maybe maybe 
share PCF's Facebook slide that we posted this last week for our Good Friday and Easter Sunday services. Maybe email or, or call somebody and say, um, you know, here's how you can hop on to the PCF Facebook service. And we would love to have folks hear the gospel and join us for that Easter celebration this coming Sunday. And then finally, I'm just so grateful to all of you who have given generously to our Deacons Fund. It's been deeply encouraging for me to see how we as a church body are loving and serving one another in this time. And I know our deacons are meeting regularly to discuss how we can meet practical financial needs. Um, as a church, we want to serve and help you if you find yourself in need in this time. So please do contact Bernadette Oinenen, who's heading up our task force to help folks, or contact me or you can contact the church office by calling us or emailing info at pcfchurch.org. We want to help you. We want to serve one another as the body of Christ. So just let us know um, how we can come alongside you and serve you. Thanks to everyone, uh, all, of, all of you who have continued to give faithfully, regularly, generously to our general fund during this time. We need that. So please do continue to give as you're able as an act of worship to God. For our call to worship uh, on this Palm Sunday, we're going to share a responsive reading that focuses on Jesus as our King. And I'll read the part of the leader, and I want to invite you to respond out loud from your homes by reading the part of the congregation. Hopefully you've printed that out, uh, if you got it on the PCF News, or maybe you've opened another browser and found it on the PCF face Facebook page so that you can follow along. This is a Palm Sunday responsive reading, and I'll begin by reading the part of the leader. And God said to Abram, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And God said to Jacob, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Amen. 
and amen. It's good to celebrate King Jesus together with you. For our pastoral prayer this morning, I'm going to pray part of a prayer that was co-written by our mission partner, George Renner, in this time of coronavirus. I'm thankful to George for permission to, to use this prayer. George, as many of you know, is deeply involved with theological education in Africa. And because of that, he's very aware of how coronavirus is affecting those in the developing world. Maybe we don't even usually have that perspective ourselves. Uh, George is thinking about those who don't have access to clean water and sanitation and those who have no possibility of social distancing because they're jammed into crowded slums. I mean, there's, there's no way they can keep that distance from each other. And so I want to let uh, George and his prayer guide us as a congregation into a time of prayer on this Palm Sunday. So please pray with me. King Jesus, we confess our sadness and our fears. We confess that at times we feel stuck and trapped and overwhelmed and helpless. King Jesus, help us to believe that our, our present does not control our future, that we can look forward and not just backward. Enable us to change our situation by bringing your kingdom into our communities. Lord, in this moment, we pray especially for those fighting on the front lines of the pandemic. We pray for our first responders, for nurses, doctors, other healthcare professionals who are working so hard to save as many lives as they can. Shelter them from this virus and grant your healing mercies to those who will inevitably get sick despite their best efforts to protect themselves. Help our government and society mobilize to provide the protective and medical equipment they need to keep up as best they can with the onslaught of patients that is already here or on its way. And help those of us not in the healthcare sector to do the most important thing we can to protect them and lessen the severity of the strain they face. Help us to stay home. King Jesus, we pray for our missionaries as they encounter these strange and unsettling times and seek to adjust and serve you. We pray for Scott Larson and Straight Ahead. And we pray particularly for this need they face to find funds for 15 interns who have lost their jobs and relied on that income. Oh God, would you help Scott and his team to find that money? Please provide what they need so that these interns can continue to be paid. We are all ultimately afraid of hunger and that fear grows during a time of modern plague when we see even more people going without their daily bread and suffering from food insecurity. Give us the strength not to hoard, but rather the courage to share what we have in order to provide daily bread for all. There is always enough for all if we find the creative, personal, communal, and political ways to share it together. So Lord, we know that we often find you and each other when we eat and fellowship together. And we pray that you will grow and sustain within us an eagerness to be together in the flesh once again. In this time of social distancing, please increase our appetite for deep relationship with one another. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lord, give us the faith and the courage to make that proclamation even in a time of a deadly virus. Give us the patience in tribulation that the Apostle Paul prays, us, pray, prays for. Because we know what your kingdom on earth brings, give us the hope of that kingdom in our hearts and lives and communities and the nations. Let that future we believe in help to sustain us in the present, even when things we can't control seem to dominate our lives. And Lord, help us to believe that the virus, the threats, the injustices, and the fears they create are not in control and never will be. King Jesus, you sit on the throne and you are in control. And we affirm that with joy and gladness on this Palm Sunday, praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are coming now to the preaching of God's Word, so I want to invite you to take out a Bible 
or your phone or whatever it is you read the scriptures on and turn over to Isaiah chapter 47 and verses 1 through 5. Isaiah 47, 1 through 5. This may seem to you at first like kind of a strange passage for Palm Sunday, but stick with me here as I read it and begin to explain it. And I think you'll see eventually why I've decided to stay in our Isaiah series for this morning rather than going elsewhere. Isaiah chapter 47 and verses 1 through 15. So please follow along in your Bible with me as I read, and then I would love for you to keep that Bible open because we're going to look at this passage fairly closely, and I would love for you to be able to follow along as I preach God's Word. Isaiah 47, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind flour. Put off your veil. Strip off your robe. Uncover your legs. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. And your disgrace shall be seen. I will take vengeance. And I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, is the Holy One of Israel. Sit in silence. And go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy. On the aged you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. You, should, you said, I shall be mistress forever. So that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now therefore hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. These two things shall come to you in a moment, in one day. The loss of children and widowhood shall come upon you in full measure. In spite of your many sorceries and the great power of your enchantments, you felt secure in your wickedness. You said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. But evil shall come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster shall fall upon you, for which you will not be able to atone. And ruin shall come upon you suddenly, of which you know nothing. Stand fast in your enchantments and your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you may be able to succeed. Perhaps you may inspire terror. You are wearied with your many counsels. Let them stand forth and save you. Those who divide the heavens, who gaze at the stars, who at the new moons make known what shall come upon you. Behold, they are like stubble. The fire consumes them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. No coal for warming oneself is this. No fire to sit beside. Such to you are those with whom you have labored, who have done business with you from your youth. They wander about, each in his own direction. There is no one to save you. This is the reading of God's word, and it's intended for us as people. The first thing I want us to see here is that Babylon the city and the empire that conquered the whole world, including Israel, is pictured in verse 1 as a royal figure, as a queen. Look at verse 1 again. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. That term Chaldeans is just simply another way of referring to the Babylonians. And the reference to the throne in verse 1 is why I say that Babylon is pictured as a royal figure because kings and queens sit on thrones. In fact, verse 5 refers to Babylon as the mistress of kingdoms. And an equally good translation of that word mistress is queen. You could say Babylon is the queen of kingdoms. In the Bible, Babylon comes to represent those who are opposed to God, those who rebel against him and go their own way. In fact, you might re remember that in the book of Revelation, the Roman Empire is known as Babylon. It's called Babylon. And that means that what we learn about Babylon here in chapter 47 of Isaiah 
is relevant not just to some ancient kingdom, king, kingdom or city that was powerful 2,600 years ago, but to our world today. This is relevant. What we read here about Babylon is absolutely kind of front page relevant to our experience wherever opposition to God exists. So we receive in this description of Queen Babylon insight into all human hearts that are opposed to God. And we really do learn a lot about this queen in chapter 47. What I want to do here is highlight four things in particular about Queen Babylon. So if you're taking notes, just follow along. Four things about this, this nation, the city of Babylon that's described as a queen here in chapter 47. Number one, Babylon is an oppressive queen. Look at verse 6 where God recounts the story of how Israel first came under Babylonian domination and then what Babylon did next. God's going to tell Babylon, here's how you came to conquer Israel. Verse 6, God says, I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. He's talking to Babylon. You showed them no mercy. On the aged, you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. So even though God is sovereign over Babylon's conquest of Jerusalem, their sacking of the city, their destruction of the temple in 587 BC, nevertheless, God holds Babylon accountable for how they responded. And they did not respond at all well. They, they, sh they said, uh, God says, they showed no mercy. And God uses here the image of placing a very heavy yoke on the shoulders of the aged. In other words, even those captives who were the weakest and neediest were treated mercilessly by Babylon. And I think probably the implication is if they treated even the older folks that way, how much worse did they treat all the others? The point is Babylon is an oppressive queen. And of course this is not unique to one particular city or empire. Human relationships of authority in this life are often distorted and warped by sin, and they often become oppressive because of that in every context and at every level. In fact, just think about it. We know from the very beginning, after Adam and Eve's fall into sin, that the husband-wife relationship became distorted. God designed Adam to be a strong, tender, servant leader, to lead his wife. That's what husbands are meant to do. But after the fall, the husband would often be oppressive and domineering in leadership. So right after Adam and Eve's fall into sin, in Genesis chapter 3, God says to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And we see all too often today husbands who oppress the wives they're meant to serve and to lead into Christ. In fact, I've been hearing that during this time of coronavirus, um, where domestic abuse exists already, it's worsening. And my heart breaks for those, those wives often who are um, oppressed by husbands. That's a result of the fall. And that's just one example of many where human relationships, because of sin, are distorted and warped and bent. That kind of oppressive rule occurs in religion, just like everywhere else. Jesus criticized the religious leaders of his day for tying up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and laying them on people's shoulders, but not being willing to move them with their own finger, Matthew 23. And of course, we see the same thing played out in the political sphere. Jesus told his disciples that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, Mark chapter 10. Authoritarian governments all over the world oppress and dominate their own people. And we often see our politicians intent on personal advancement, personal gain, rather than serving those they lead. It happens over and over and over again. But let's be honest, don't we see this same impulse in our own hearts? If we think about it, haven't there been times when we have oppressed others? Haven't there been times when we have been cruel and harsh and unfeeling and unkind and manipulative and self-serving in our relationships? 
Because we're sinful, this is what our hearts will do apart from the influence of God's redeeming grace. It's what our relationships will look like. Of course, the really bad news for Babylon here in Isaiah 47 is that they are oppressing God's chosen people, Israel. And therefore, God himself is angry with them. And you know what? The same is true whenever and wherever in the world the powerful take advantage of the weak. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 5. I read it this last week. It says, Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. And we should hear that very, very carefully. Whoever mocks the poor insults his maker. The point is, God is the maker of all people, including the poor. And when we oppress others, we insult the very one, God, who made them in his image. So we're wronging not only other people when we oppress them, but God himself, and we will have to face the consequences. So this first point is Babylon, and all of us as we represent those who are opposed to God, Babylon is an oppressive queen. Here's another indication of who Babylon is, another indictment of Babylon. It is, number two, a selfish queen. And we see this in verse 8. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely. You lover of pleasures. The ancient city of Babylon was very wealthy, and they had amassed that wealth because of their conquest and because of all their trade. Last week, I showed you a photo of the amazing Ishtar Gate that led into the city. And actually, this week, I saw some photos from the Trehi kids who had made their own versions of the Ishtar Gate in their homeschool. And guys, I wanted to say I love that. Well done. Um, do you remember that photo I showed you of the Ishtar Gate? It's, it's, it's so high. It's so beautiful. The color is so lavish. And the point of that gate was to demonstrate the, the wealth and the influence of Babylon. And God says here in verse 8 that they didn't merely have pleasures, but they were lovers of those pleasures. They savored them. They wanted to have more. And it was just as they were oppressing the poor and the weak and, and increasing the weight of that yoke that they were enjoying luxuries for themselves. And again, this is as relevant as yesterday's newspaper, today's newspaper. It is normal in fallen human hearts to look for what's in it for us, to seek to accumulate pleasures even at the expense of others. There's been talk recently, this, this last week, about some U.S. senators who were publicly downplaying the coronavirus some weeks ago, but they knew it would be worse than they were saying because they were receiving private briefings that others weren't privy to. In fact, these senators, the allegation is, were in fact uh, privately selling off personal stocks that they knew would lose value when this virus got worse. Now, I don't know whether all those charges of uh, insider trading are true or not, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were. And that's normal. Uh, of course, it's wrong, but it's normal. It's normal for sinful human hearts to seek to gain and enjoy pleasure even at the expense of others. In fact, again, don't we see that in our own hearts? We certainly see it even in young children. If there's one cookie left, the natural impulse of a child is not to give it to the other child or even to split it in half two ways. The normal impulse is to say, that's mine. Give it to me. Babylon's love of pleasure, its selfishness, is representative of all of us. So that's sobering. Here's a third important insight in this passage into Queen Babylon. Babylon is a fragile queen. They don't think they are, but they are. In fact, one of the gravest sins of Babylon is its pride. Not only is it oppressive and selfish, but it's convinced that it won't ever be held accountable. It's here to stay. And I want you to see this in verses 7 through 8. 7 and 8. You said, I shall be mistress or queen forever so that you did not lay these things to heart or remember their end. Now therefore hear this, you lover of pleasures, who sit securely, at least they think they do, who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. And then drop down to verse 10. You felt secure in your wickedness. 
you said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge led you astray. And you said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. So do you hear Babylon's confidence? And do you hear the blasphemy that's twice repeated in these verses? Babylon says twice, I am, and there is no one besides me. If that sounds a little bit familiar, it's because two chapters earlier, in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 5, God himself says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. That means when Babylon says here, I am, and there is no one besides me, it's talking like God. It's putting itself in the place of God. Why are they so confident? Well, th their confidence seems to be founded on a number of things. It's, it's wealth. Babylon's wealth is one of their sources of confidence. Another is their spirituality. If you look at verses 12 and 13, you'll see that those verses suggest that enchantment and sorcery and astrology are areas of expertise and confidence for Babylon. And we actually know that Babylon was famous in the ancient world for its magical arts and astrology. And then also it seems from this passage that Babylon was priding itself on its wisdom and knowledge. It just didn't think it would ever be held accountable. No one sees me, it says. Those of us in the Western world can absolutely relate here to Babylon's confidence, can't we? We've got lots of wealth. We've got lots of spirituality. We've got lots of education and learning. And we feel so secure in these things. But in fact, here's the, here's the twist in this passage. Babylon's great pride is blinding it to the fragility of its position. Yeah, they, they think their spirituality and their wealth and their education, they think those things are their source of stability. But in fact, they're the very things that are blinding Babylon to its instability. Babylon is hanging by a thread. It's teetering on the brink of destruction, and it doesn't even know it. And again, is it any different today? I say not at all. Em and I have been watching this documentary series that details the ways in which the rich in our world often oppress the poor. So things like predatory lenders who are ruining the lives of those living paycheck to paycheck. Pharmaceutical companies that exorbitantly raise the prices of medications that people need just in order to stay alive. Car companies that are cheating on emissions tests to make money, even though those increased emissions, those illegal emissions, are killing people. And the staggering feature for m and I as we've watched this series, uh, many of these folks, is that they don't think they'll get caught by other people, let alone by God. In fact, even after they're found out and accosted and charged, they often maintain their innocence. So they're blind to their own sin. Again, I want to, I want to take us to ourselves. Don't we see this tendency in our own hearts? We are often oblivious to our own fragility. And I wonder if that's one of the things that God is teaching us through this current pandemic. We often assume that life will just go on normally, that we'll have our job, that we'll be in decent health, that our plans will come to fruition. If we plan to do it, it'll happen. Remember the book of James that calls us on the carpet for that assumption, and it says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring, so you better not assume that your plans will come to pass. You should say, James 2.15, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And coronavirus is an opportunity for us to humble ourselves and recognize the fragility of our lives. It's an opportunity to remind ourselves that we are not the sovereign and that Jesus is. Like Babylon, we are much more fragile than we think we are. And we've all felt that, experienced that, we're living that this last couple of weeks and even now to today. The message of this chapter is that God is in fact going to bring tremendous sudden judgment upon Babylon. So this is the fourth thing we see about Babylon. She is a humiliated queen. The announcements of God's judgment in this chapter are frequent and they are fierce. So beginning in verse 1, Babylon is told to get off her throne and sit in the dust. 
And there are three main images of God's judgment upon this city, upon this nation, in chapter 47. First, Babylon will now be a slave. She's going to be forced to do menial work like grinding flour. That's the lowest of the low. Working the millstones to grind the flour was the lowest form of slavery. That's number one. Number two, Babylon will be stripped naked and publicly humiliated, verse 3. Uh, what, a, what, a, what an absolute low point for them to be stripped naked and shamed before all those who are watching. And then third, Babylon will become a widow and will lose her children, verse 9. That's a terrible scenario in the ancient world where status and financial security were closely connected with having family. All of this is going to come from God himself. That's so important for us to see. It's not just going to be happenstance or, or bad luck. Verse 3, God says, I will take vengeance and I will spare no one. And it's going to happen very suddenly. Verse 9, these things shall come upon you in a moment, in one day. When God brings judgment, here's the point, none of the things that Babylon found security in will help them at all. In fact, God ironically challenges them in verse 12. Stand firm in your enchantments and your many sorceries with which you have labored from your youth. Perhaps you may be able to succeed. Perhaps you may inspire terror. And of course, God knows that's not going to work at all. Uh, God says all their diviners won't be able to save even themselves. I mean, let alone help Babylon. They, can't, they won't be able to save themselves. They'll be burned up. There will be none to save Babylon. So Babylon is an oppressive selfish, fragile, humiliated queen. And that's the case for every human ruler, every human heart that pits itself against God. Now, I want to ask, how should we apply this teaching to our lives on this Palm Sunday in the time of coronavirus? Here's where I want to go with this. I want you all to remember back to your high school English class. And maybe you're right now, you are in high school English, so you don't need to remember back all that far. Uh, I want you to try to remember what a foil is. Do you ever remember in dramatic terms hearing what a foil is? A foil is someone or something that serves as a contrast to another. In other words, a foil is a character that's created to highlight the opposing traits of another character. I learned this week that the term foil comes from an old jeweler's practice of setting a gem on a foil base to enhance its shine because the light reflects off the foil and, and the gem begins to sparkle. Um, in the famous story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Hyde is a foil to Dr. Jekyll. And Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer is a foil to Huckleberry Finn. Dr. Watson is a foil to Sherlock Holmes. Sometimes Dr. Watson is a little slow on the uptake and that makes Sherlock Holmes seem even smarter than he otherwise would be. Uh, in the Harry Potter series, Draco Malfoy is a foil to Harry Potter. So Harry Potter's moral goodness and his noble nature and his true friendships are accentuated by the contrast with Malfoy who is wicked and petty and selfish and doesn't enjoy true friendships. So I want us to see that Queen Babylon itself in Isaiah 47 is a foil. And the question is, for what? What's it a foil for? Well, first of all, in this immediate context, it's a foil for God's people Israel in the very next chapter in Isaiah 48. And it's a foil for the holy city, Jerusalem, that's mentioned in Isaiah 48 verse 2. You could say that these two chapters, Isaiah 47 and 48, tell the tale of two cities. So the message of Isaiah 47 is that Babylon is a sinful city and therefore it's going to be destroyed by the God of Israel. And the message of Isaiah 48 is that God's people Israel are also a sinful people. In fact, we're going to get to Isaiah 48 and when we do, you'll see that God really lays into Israel in chapter 48. He tells them that they're obstinate, that their neck is an iron sinew and their forehead is brass. They're hard-headed. Uh, he tells them that they're given to idol worship, that they are treacherous rebels. And yet, and yet, stunningly, Isaiah 48 
goes a different direction from Isaiah 47. Isaiah 48 announces that God will not destroy his people Israel as he plans to destroy Babylon. Instead, strikingly, God plans to redeem Israel to deliver them from their captivity in Babylon. They're going to go out from Babylon with shouts of joy saying, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. In fact, the point of Isaiah 48 is to urge God's people to leave exile in Babylon and return to the city of Jerusalem once again. And here's the thing. Both Babylon and Israel are rebellious sinners, but they get very different treatment from God. Babylon gets judgment. Israel receives redemption. Why the difference? Well, part of the answer is given in Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. We'll come to these verses. In those verses, God says, that he's going to withhold his anger from Israel, not because of Israel, but for his own namesake, for the sake of his praise. And the other explanation comes in the next chapter, Isaiah 49, where we're introduced once again to the figure of the servant of the Lord. We know from the New Testament that Jesus Christ is the servant about whom Isaiah writes, Jesus' life and death and resurrection is why God's people will receive redemption instead of the judgment they deserve. In the larger scope of the Bible, Babylon is a foil for someone else as well. So first of all, in the immediate context, Babylon, Queen Babylon, is a foil for Jerusalem and for Israel. But I want to close on this Palm Sunday by comparing Queen Babylon with someone else. Queen Babylon, representing worldly rule and influence, is a foil for King Jesus. And if we set Jesus' life and ministry and rule and kingship over against worldly types of rule, it's like putting a piece of foil under the gem that is Jesus. We see his difference and his uniqueness and his beauty even more clearly. The gem sparkles. On this Palm Sunday, we celebrate a very, very different kind of king. We read earlier in the service, in the responsive reading, the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And Jesus is clearly affirmed as a king by the crowds who shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. What's more, though, than that, it's not just the crowds affirm Jesus as king, it's that Jesus means to be identified as a king. We're told that he chooses to enter Jerusalem on a young donkey. Why does he do that? Well, in order to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9, fear not daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming sitting on a donkey's colt. On the first Palm Sunday Jesus intentionally acts in such a way as to identify himself as Israel's king. But what kind of king is he exactly? And the answer is, he is diametrically opposed to the Babylonian type of rule. He is diametrically opposed to worldly values of kingship. Babylon is an oppressive queen. We've already seen that. But Jesus is a gentle king. Babylon, you remember we saw, places this exceedingly heavy yoke on the shoulders of the aged and presumably of all. It rules for its own advantage. It takes what it can get from those whom it rules. But Jesus says, Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Babylonian type of rule is a heavy, exceedingly heavy yoke and Jesus' yoke is a light one. Jesus is a gentle king. Babylon is a selfish queen but Jesus is a servant king. You know our hearts apart from God naturally want to be served by others but Jesus comes to serve and you can see this really clearly in the Gospel of John. You know, John 12 is the triumphal entry. And then the very next chapter, John 13, John tells the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. 
John says that Jesus rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And it becomes very clear in the rest of John chapter 13 that this foot washing is a sim symbol of Jesus' washing of his disciples' sin through his death on the cross. So Jesus' rule is that of a servant. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Babylon is a fragile queen, but Jesus is an enduring king. So the point of Isaiah 47 we've seen is that Babylon, which is absolutely confident that it's invincible, it's not going to go anywhere, it's, it's not going to be brought down, it actually, in point of fact, is about to be brought down by God in judgment. Babylon thinks of itself as a brick wall, as unshakable, but it's actually a china plate, easily breakable. But unlike Babylon, Jesus' kingdom cannot be touched. So in John chapter 18, Jesus says to Pontius Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus' kingdom endures forever. He'll never leave the throne. But there is a shocker here. Uh, I've just pointed out three clear contrasts between Queen Babylon and King Jesus. But here's the final one. Babylon is a humiliated queen. And Jesus is a humiliated king. Babylon will be stripped bare and cast naked to the ground. It will be publicly shamed and humiliated for defying God. And so will Jesus. So will Jesus. Jesus will hang naked on a cross. Public nudity is shameful. It still is. It always was in the ancient world. Crucifixion in Jesus' day was the most shameful, painful way to die. Jesus will be cast down, broken, discarded, crushed. Queen Babylon got what it deserved. Jesus got what we deserved. Jesus, King Jesus, took our sin. He took our shame, all of it. And that's the kind of king Jesus is. He is humiliated, not for his own sin, but for ours. We serve, brothers and sisters, a king unlike any other. We serve the one true, glorious King Jesus. We affirm Jesus' kingship whenever we call him Jesus Christ, because Christ is the Greek version of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which means anointed one or Messiah. That's a kingly figure. Jesus Christ is another way of saying King Jesus. So let's celebrate and worship our gentle, enduring, humiliated servant king who will one day return from heaven in glory and be seen and acknowledged by everyone as the king of the universe. Let's pray. King Jesus, we celebrate you. We worship you. Unlike any other human ruler, Lord Jesus, you came to give your life for us. And we are going to walk through this coming week and remember who you are and what you did. Jesus, may our observance of Holy Week be sweet and precious and sobering and worship producing as we recall to mind your redemptive work in our behalf and as we celebrate your rule now over our lives and over this world and over the whole universe. Thank you, Jesus, that you stand apart. And we need you more than ever on the throne in this time. 
We need to believe that there is nothing happening apart from your wise and sovereign rule. We need to believe that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so we thank you for this reminder this morning that you are king. We celebrate you, Jesus, as we come now to the table, to the Lord's Supper, scattered across this region, scattered in other parts of this country or maybe the world. Lord, we, um, we celebrate our unity in Christ. And we ask you to make this a meaningful time, although it's not what we long for, to, to celebrate it in person. It is a gift to us in this moment to remind our, one another of our uni unity in Christ and to remind one another of your gentle, humble, servant-hearted rule over our lives. So may we receive the bread and the cup with joy and gratitude. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're coming now to the Lord's Supper, so if you have the bread and cup nearby, you can prepare those to receive together. We are going to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper as believers together. You don't need to be a, a member or a regular at attender of Pepperell Christian Fellowship to join with us. It is very, very important, though, that you not take the bread and the cup unless you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ and unless you're in right relationship with others. Uh, the Apostle Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 11, this is serious, very serious what we're about to do. Uh, and the Corinthians, there were people in the, this early church in Corinth who were sick and some were dying, Paul says, because they were eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. So we're not playing games here. We are receiving grace here, but there's also danger if we receive this, the, these symbols, these marks of grace um, in an unworthy manner. We want to be careful. Uh, we want to examine our own hearts before we take the bread and the cup. And if you're not a believer, I would encourage you not to share this meal with us. If you are pierced by Christ even through the, this last hour and you're you're wanting to believe in the gospel, you may repent now and trust in Jesus and then receive the bread and cup. If you're not in right relationship with others, again, I want to warn you away from this table. Uh, we should not take um, the, these uh, markers of Jesus' forgiveness for us if we haven't extended forgiveness to others. So maybe now in this moment you can do business with God. And you can get in right relationship with someone. Maybe right now you should pick up the phone and make a phone call. Or maybe you should just, if there's, there's bitterness you're harboring or hardness of heart, you should release that and then take the Lord's Supper. Please, please don't drink judgment to yourselves. And unfortunately, I can't be here. Um, I mean, I'm here, but I can't see you through this camera. So I just want to ask you to take uh, this meal very seriously and to guard your heart. But then, if you are in right relationship with God, if you have, your, your sin has been washed away by the blood of Jesus, and you've done what you can to be in right relationship with others, I want to encourage you to this table, and I want to uh, share with you, as your brother in Christ, the bread and the cup. Let's begin by taking the, the bread. Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. We take a moment now to worship Christ, um, to confess sin, to thank him for forgiveness of sin, to do business with Jesus. Lord Jesus, we're so grateful for your cleansing of our sin. We're so grateful for your body broken for us. May we receive fresh grace as we call to our minds and hearts your ultimate sacrifice 
your substitutionary death in our place for our eternal life. We thank you, King Jesus, dying King Jesus, in your name. Amen. And now we're going to take the cup representing the blood, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who says in John 10, um, no one takes my life from me. Um, Jesus, Jesus was not out of control as he walked to the cross, not at all. It's very clear in John's gospel that he is in absolute command and control of every event, even the time of his death. Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down and I'll take it up again. And so we remember as we drink this cup, we remember the shed blood of Jesus shed for us so that God can say, your sin, your sin, I, I forget about it. I, I separate as far as the east is from the west. Um, I don't hold it against you. You are righteous and you're a son and a daughter and you're welcome into my presence. That's what this cup represents for us, the, the shed blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup. So Lord Jesus, again, we come to you and we are thankful for your shed blood that washes away our sin. Father, uh, for those who have sinned this week, that's all of us, and those who feel particularly guilty for sin, broken by sin, in bondage and captivity to sin, would you come right now by your Holy Spirit and grant us freedom, gospel freedom, to see that Jesus suffered in our place. And there isn't double jeopardy. You won't punish us for the sin Jesus was already punished for. So we're free and we're accepted and we're loved and you delight in us and you sing over us, Lord Jesus, as we've taken this broken body and the shed blood into ourselves, into our bodies. Please bring afresh the joy of gospel forgiveness and gospel healing and gospel cleansing and gospel joy. We take refuge in, in you, Lord Jesus, and we sing with shouts of joy. We thank you as your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remember that David Fenton's adult education class is going to begin on Zoom about 10 minutes from now at 11.15 a.m. And as soon as you come off this Facebook live stream, you can hop onto that Zoom call. We would love for many of you to join us on that call uh, studying 1 Corinthians. And then I also hope to see a bunch of you tomorrow night. I mean, actually see you. So it's not just one way, you seeing me, but I can see you and pray with you tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for our Monday evening encouragement and prayer time. And then again this Friday for our live stream here on Facebook Live for our Good Friday service starting at 7 p.m. That's a communion service. Let's be, brothers and sisters, let's be preparing our hearts throughout the course of this week for our celebration of Easter next Sunday. We've ne None of us have ever had a Holy Week quite like this one we're heading into. And it is a time to take the gospel more seriously and to embrace and cherish the goodness of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit more closely than we ever have. God reigns from his throne in the time of coronavirus. And Easter, Good Friday and Easter, remind us that he's conquered death. And that if all of us were to get coronavirus and to die, we would appear again instantly in the very presence of God with one another, celebrating him forever. We have eternal life made available to us because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So let's take it seriously and treasure God's redemptive work in this particular Easter week, of all Easter weeks. Now I want, to, I want to close with the benediction on this Palm Sunday 2020. I wish I could see you and see your faces as I give you this blessing, this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may you, as the people of risen, resurrected, reigning King Jesus, trust in him at all times. May you be unafraid. May you exalt in him. May you serve others because he has served you and freed you from death. May we as his people live for him on mission this week as we extend the kingdom of God that Jesus came to secure. God bless all of you.